If you would, take a Bible and uh, open it up with me. Today we're going to start <coughs> in the book of Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 44. I thought it would be interesting, just for a moment, uh, as we spend a few minutes, taking a look at the manger scene. You know, when we have the kids come up and, and we have the, the, the manger and the baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary, I think it's important for us to grasp <coughs> The story that God is telling through the people there. You know, we know that, that Joseph was a carpenter, but I think his name um, was carried a long time back to the Joseph in the book of, of Genesis. You know, here's a guy who was mistreated by his brothers and sold into slavery, kicked out of, kicked out of the house and said, don't ever come back. We don't need you and we don't need your dreams. Go away. And he found himself each and every time at the worst of a situation. There, through what God had blessed him with, he always finds himself at one point in time or the other coming up to the top and being the leader of whatever it is that he was put in charge of. And in Genesis chapter 45, Joseph's brothers have come and he's sent them away. They come again and he sent them away. He said, oh, by the way, you know, sorry that you stole something. I'm going to have to keep these guys until you bring, you know, your little brother just to prove to me that you're all right. And they said, oh, but you don't understand the little brother. Oh, yeah, we, if we do that, it'll, it'll kill our father. They go back and they bring him. And here's <laughs> Joseph in an Egyptian court, in Egyptian clothing. And he shows himself to his brothers. Genesis chapter 45, verse 1 and following. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was, for you to, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, uh, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. It was the, the defining moment in the Joseph of the Old Testament. And I wonder as Joseph, the husband of Mary, what he thought about as he was raising a baby and a boy named Jesus. Was there something that he took from this passage to think that I am a part of the story of deliverance. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ruth. It's going to be in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. There's a story here that happens in Moab. And a woman named Orpah had some sons, and they married some Moabite ladies. Sons died. Excuse me, Naomi was there, Orpah and Ruth. 
Naomi was there and uh, your sons died. Orpah said, I'm going back home. And Naomi said, I'm going with you, Naomi. I want to go back to your people. and I will be with your people and your God will be my God. And, and Naomi basically said, no, you don't need to do that. And he said, don't turn me away. I'm not sure what it was like for Naomi. She had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. Her life apparently had gotten so bad that when she came back home out of the land of Moab, she changed her name. She said, instead, don't call me Naomi anymore, but call me Mara. For my life is bitter. When we fast forward back to the New Testament, back to the Gospel of Luke, we see the angel Gabriel interacting with a lot of people. We see a man named Joseph who was taking a woman named Mary to be his wife. And I think it's interesting that Mary, Jesus' mother's name, is derived from that renaming of Ruth. Bitterness. And I think it's important for us to grasp that on either side of the manger, sets bitterness and deliverance. You see, because it's easy for us, isn't it? To think, well, you know, at least we don't have to put ourselves into that place. Or maybe it's easy for us to just focus on all the good things and say, okay, yeah, Jesus is coming and we're just going to be about the deliverance. But sometimes, we find ourselves at this Christmas time focusing on all the bitterness. You see, it's interesting to me that as you take a look at the names and the words associated with the names and the people of who they are here around Jesus in the manger, you have each and every one of us and how we come Christmas time. I know that sometimes pain is reopened at Christmas time. And we find ourselves looking at all the hurt. And I wonder what Mary experienced as she watched her son go to the cross where the bitterness of her name she saw there. I think it's clear at least from the absence of Joseph's mention there at the cross that he had probably passed away before he Whatever the reason is, we don't find it in Scripture much after Jesus' uh, birth. You know, he goes to Egypt and he comes back. And that's about all we ever hear anymore of Joseph. But here's a man who celebrated the deliverance. And I think it's interesting that as we come out of the book of Luke, we find ourselves with one little verse by which Christmas, the Advent season, focuses all around. If you would, please turn with me to the book of Luke. We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26. It's the sixth month, and 
we understand that it's from this, that it's the sixth month of the time when John the Baptist had been conceived. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And you will be with child, and you will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even, your, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Watch this, verse 37. This is the angel's words a woman who is hearing all of this, trying to put it all together. I wonder what she thought. I wonder what came to mind. I wonder if the passages from the Old Testament that she had heard in the synagogue about how the Messiah would suffer came to mind. I wonder if the passages from the Old Testament came to mind that a virgin will be with a child. I wonder what came to her mind when the angel, after he laid all of this out, said to her, because nothing is impossible with God. And so here we are today putting together in our hearts and in our minds what is the meaning of Christmas. Sometimes we celebrate deliverance. Sometimes we experience again the bitterness. But here in the middle, Jesus meets us, Emmanuel, forgiveness, grace, nothing is impossible with God. <clears throat> you may be sitting here on either side of this manger. Can I really be delivered? Can, can God really forgive me? Can he really do the things that he says that he will do? Nothing is impossible with God. Why is this time so hard? Why does all the hurt Father God, is there any hope for me in coming back to the middle? Nothing is impossible with God. Christ.
Christmas time. Celebrate the impossible. Hold on to the impossible. Fall in love with the impossible. Worship the God who does the impossible. Give him your heart. Give him your life. Let him do inside of you the impossible. Would you please pray with me? Father God, We see throughout scripture the picture that you paint with two people going through a hard situation at a hard time in the world, being drawn away from their home, taken to a place where there's nobody who will take care of them, left abandoned. As your angel told Mary, that nothing is impossible with you, we find ourselves dealing with issues of faith, and grace, and forgiveness, and mercy, righteousness, sanctification. <coughs> decisions that are being made today. If the decision that you'd like to make is that one to surrender yourself to the impossible, to let Jesus cleanse your life. Today's the day to come forward.